Okay, once again, we will start the event, so please sit back. Swastiastu, salam kebajikan, namo budaya. Good morning and hello to all of you, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Auditorium Cyber Library Universitas Nasional. First of all, let's say thanks to God who has give us guidance, healthy and mercy, so we can attend and participate in this event without any obstacles. Welcome to the International Symposium Women and Primatology with title What Attract Female into Science and Conservation of Non-Human Primates. Introduce myself, Rahmi Mahira, but all of you can call me Ira and also my partner Cindy Ervita Tamara as Master of Ceremony in this event. Welcome and in honor to Professor Dr. Ernawati Sinaga, MS Apate, as Vice Rector for Research, Community Service, and Cooperation. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Tatang Mitra Setia, MSI, as Organizing Committee. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Erin R. Vogel from Rutgers University, USA. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Cheryl Knott from Boston University, USA. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Erin Riley from the San Diego State University, USA. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Susan M. Shenny from Oxford Brookes University, UK. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Maria Farnot White from Zuri University. Welcome and in honor to Dr. Wuryanti Setiadi M. Biomed from Aikman Center for Molecular Biology, Brain Indonesia. Welcome and in honor to all of speaker presentation and also all of the moderator. Welcome and honor to all of official that we cannot mention one by one, but certainly does not reduce our respect. And also welcome and in honor and all of best wishes to all of the audience who attend this event. Ladies and gentlemen, before we start this event and before we enter in the core of the show, we will read our uh, our we will read out the agenda in this event. Okay, first opening remarks, sing a song our anthem and march Universitas Nasional. Second, first keynote speaker. Third, first session presentation with Q and A. Four, lunch break. Five, second keynote speaker. Six, second session presentation with Q&A. Seven, third session presentation with Q&A. Closing remarks, poster competition announcement and closing. Okay, wow, there are so many event and hopefully all of you can attend until the end of the day and got many insight and new knowledge. And don't forget to always pay attention of COVID-19 protocol. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, before we enter the main event and before we start this event, let's stand together to be able to sing our national anthem, Indonesia Raya, and we'll be continue by singing along Mars Universitas Nasional. Please stand up and operator, please play Indonesia Raya and Mars Universitas Nasional.
Stuart and will join us in these women and primatologies. I wonder what Ibutari, what attract Ibutari to join us. I don't know. We will he hear from from her later. Listening to listening to your talk, the the women primatologies in the symposium maybe will open the gap to peek at what is in the minds and maybe in the feelings of the this, this women female scientists who engage in and conducting research on non-human planets. I myself really want to know the answer to this question, which is the tagline of this symposium. Ladies and gentlemen, all of my dear colleagues and students, Primatology is actually a very interesting field. Although I'm not a primatologist, but I understand that study, studying primatology not only can help us in, conserve, in conserving our nature in which we live, but also in understanding ourselves, the human primates. Studies of non-human primates provide important insight into our understanding of the biology and sociology of human primates, of ourselves. However, because the field for primatology studies is not an easy one, it is still interesting and intriguing for me to know what really attracts my colleagues, the female primatologists, to enter and dive in the deep of the forest to study non-human primates. Hopefully, the symposium will answer this question so that will be more women will enter the scientific world of primatology. Ladies and gentlemen, once again, I would like to extend my sincere gratitude to all the speakers, Indonesian and international speakers, and also to all participants that has allocated their time to talk and discuss in this important symposium and share the joy of being scientists, especially being a female primatologist. I hope all of you would enjoy this interesting and important symposium, and I hope that, we, that what, what we are doing now is useful for all stakeholders and gives great meaning to the progress of science and conservation of nature and the environment. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Uh, thank you to Prof. Erna. Uh, Prof, uh, before you get back, may you help us to open the event? Yes, uh, sample with the little speech, maybe? Sure. Yeah. And the operator uh, will play uh, opening sound. So help us to open the, this event. I should say something? Yes. Of okay. course. Thank you. Thank you for reminding me. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for coming. And now, officially, I will open this uh, symposium and hope we all have benefits from this symposium. Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, operator, please play the opening song. Thanks to Prof. Erna. Once again, okay, uh, Prof, sorry, uh, next is the awarding of certificate as a form of appreciation and the souvenir, which will be given by Dr. Tatang Mitra Setia MSE to Prof. Erna and to the operator and all of the concert time and place are yours. So, Prof. Yes. Awarding of certificate. Okay, the certificate. This is the souvenir. Yes. 
Yeah. Thank you. And this is the souvenir from Universitas Nasional. Okay, thank you. Give it applause. For that, we invited all of you, the audience, to join us on stage to be able to take pictures together. Yes, uh, all of our audience, you all uh, just join us in the on the stage to be able to take pictures together. Let's go. We take a picture together. All of you, all of you in this auditorium, let's join us in the stage and take a picture together. And to the documentation, please help us to take a picture. Okay. Yes. Come on. All of you guys can join us. Yes. On the stage. Uh, to the documentation, please help us. Yes, all of you. Okay. Give your best of smile. Okay. Okay, yang di atas boleh bikin dua barisan. To, to row, yes, please. Uh, biar kelihatan semua. sit back again. Thank you to the documentation and all of you guys. Please sit back. Okay, we will continue our event. Okay, uh, we will continue our event, and here we go, first keynote speaker about primate research results that are beneficial to public health from Dr. Erin R. Vogel with our first moderator, Dr. Sugarjito. I will read out CV of Dr. Sugarjito, bachelor degree at biology. Faculty, Universitas Nasional, Master Degree at Biology, 
Faculty Universitas Nasional, PhD at Ecology Faculty Universitas Utrecht, Netherlands, Lecture and Protected Areas and Ecosystem Service at the Faculty of Biology Universitas Nasional, Director of International Cooperation Office Universitas Nasional. To Dr. Erin Vogel and Dr. Sugarjito, time and place are yours. Yes. Good morning, everybody. Today we have a very prominent scientist in the field of primatology. She is uh, Dr. Erin Pochel. I correct. <laughs> I do not read the whole CV that given to me yesterday, it was too long, 20 pages. Maybe I need to drink a lot of water if I read this CV. So anyway, she, is, uh, she published many papers on peers review journal and also writing many books together with our colleagues, Indonesian scientists. I should recall my memory when I know her, Dr. Erin Vogel, personally, about 10 years ago, when we developed a proposal for USAID program. I'm very, I was very respect to her. She came to Indonesia specifically to write proposal, only five days journeys. And Especially in that time, she was in a major pregnant. <laughs> very hard to do that one. That's I very respect of her. And finally, we got that proposal and quite quite a big money, one point blah 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 million dollars. And from that proposal, we can send students for graduate and PhD training for Indo from Indonesian students. Thanks, Dr. Vogel. And she is now the director of graduate program in the anthropology department of Rutger University. I think I do not give a lot of uh, introduction. Everybody knows. I hope most of you, most of you already read her profile in the website of whatever. Uh, this time, I should give Dr. Erin Vogel just the floor for you. Uh, please give a keynote speaker for us. So Dr. Erin Vogel will deliver her speech for us today uh, in the symposium. Hello, everyone. Good morning. Salamat pagi. I want to thank everyone for coming today, and I want to thank the organizers of this wonderful symposium on women in primatology. It is an honor to be here today with all of you and to present on some of the research that we've been doing in collaboration with UNAS at Tuanan in Kalimantan Tenga. So the title of my talk today 
is what can we learn from orangutans, nutrition, and physiology about our own health. And this is a project that I started with my UNAS collaborators in 2005 when we started studying diet and nutrition and physiology in the Chuanan orangutans. And I want to acknowledge that this project would not be possible without all of the co-directors of the Tuanan Orangutan Research Station and all of their students and all of the staff and assistants who have worked with us over the years. Oops. <laughs> well, the slides are a little cut off, but that's okay. A lot of people ask me, why do we study orangutans? And orangutans split from our lineage about 14 million years ago, which is a pretty long time. Oh, there we go. But just like orangutans, just like humans, orangutans have a propensity to get really fat when in an energy-rich environment. So orangutans serve as a model organism to study diet and health in humans. Indeed, the forests of Southeast Asia have often been described as what we call a feast or famine ecology, where we have these high periods of fruit abundance, peaks in fruit abundance, followed by low periods. And this is a, an example of fruiting patterns in the peat swan habitats where we work in Kalimantan. So if you're a large frugivorous primate living in these forests, you have to figure out what to do during these periods of low fruit availability. And that is the focus of some of our research at Tuanan. And why is this important? Well, it has been proposed that our ancestors also evolved and adapted to a similar type of habitat in, just throughout their evolutionary history. So today I'm going to talk about how this unique ecology in Southeast Asia influences the dietary strategy and physiological adaptations in orangutans and how ultimately it can inform us about our own health. What we find is that diet changes depending on the availability of fruit in the habitat. And this is throughout Tuanan, but also across field sites. So when fruit availability is high, orangutans feed on a lot of fruit, and they prefer fruit. But when fruit availability is low, we find that they feed on food items that have deficits, lower amounts of energetic return. This can result in as much as a 50% decrease in energy intake. In the foundational research by Dr. Cheryl Knott, who is with us today, really informed the basis of all of the research that I've done at Tuanan. And Dr. Nan found that during her dissertation research at Gunung Pulang, she found that during the high fruit periods, orangutans feast and they eat a lot of fruit and they store and build up fat reserves. And during these periods of low fruit availability, they burn those fat reserves regularly. And this was detected with ketone bodies found in the urine of these orangutans. More recent work by Dr. Herman Ponser has further explored physiological adaptations in wild orangutans. And he found, if we look at Pongo in orange here, that orangutans actually have significantly lower total energy expenditure for a given body mass compared to other apes, including ourselves. Indeed, if we look at resting metabolic rate, it's significantly lower in orangutans. So the question is why? It has been proposed that these adaptations help them survive these episodes of fruit scarcity that are extremely unpredictable. And so, we can think about this in terms of metabolic flexibility. Metabolic flexibility 
is the ability of an organism to switch adaptively between different types of nutritional substrates as they change in their availability. And it's a really important framework for understanding adaptive capacity and physiology in response to environmental variation. So we can think about what we do when we're faced with variation in our nutrition by looking at what the orangutans are doing. So what are the nutritional strategies used by orangutans, particularly during this unpredictable, these unpredictable periods? Over the past decade, many primatologists have used what's called the geometric framework of nutrition that was introduced by my colleague, David Robinheimer. And what, they, what we find is that primates, depending on their preferred diet, greatly vary their nutritional strategies. So more frugivorous primates, like the spider monkey here, tend to prioritize the amount of protein or regulate the amount of protein so that it does not vary much. Whereas more folivorous primates, like mountain gorillas, tend to greatly vary the amount of protein in their diet to meet their nutritional needs, so their energetic needs. So pretty constant non-protein energy, lipids and fats, but great variation in protein. And other primates use a mix of these strategies, like shifakas or macaques. Jessica Rothman, who's a collaborator of ours at UNOS and Rutgers, has looked at these patterns across primate species. And as we move from red to blue to the green lines, you can see that as those primates that include more fruit, that have the lion closer to the non-protein energy axis, tend to include more protein relative to protein, non-protein energy relative to protein in their diets. But those primates that feed on more leaves, like the colobines you see here in green, tend to have more protein in their diets relative to non-protein energy. So different primate species, depending on their preferred diet, will feed will have different ratios of nutrients in their diets. So the data I'm going to talk about today with these adaptations were collected at the Tuanon Orangutan Research Station in central Kalimantan. And over the last two decades, we've habituated about 130 individuals. And we collect full day follows from nest to nest, um, data from full day follows, to quantify nutritional intake. And we also look at fruit availability in the forest every month. The FAI, we call it, the Fruit Availability Index. And we also collect the foods that the orangutans feed on. And we collect these foods by climbing trees, collecting the food items, drying them in the oven, and then co we combine those with the behavioral data from the orangutans. Basically, we received back from the laboratory run by Dr. Ibu by Dr. Rosa uh, a nutritional fact sheet for every food item that they eat. And this work is done in collaboration with Achi Zulfa here at UNAS. We also collect urine from orangutans. Um, and this is, of course, these methods were developed by our own Cheryl Knott here. And many of us are using these methods across the different field sites to examine health and physiology in wild primates. And it has been voted one of the worst, top worst jobs in science, thanks to Cheryl. <laughs> So this is a graph of fruit availability at Tuana. The orange dotted line across the middle is average fruit availability. What you can see is that sometimes the fruit is really high, sometimes it's really low. And so what we like to look at is how do orangutans adapt to these different ecological conditions? What 
what we've found in wild orangutans is very similar to what we see in other frugivorous primates. Orangutans tightly regulate the amount of protein in their diet. We see very little variation in protein between high and low periods. But we see great variation in non-protein energy, so lipids and, uh, lipids and carbohydrates, and the ratio of non-protein energy to protein. And you can see it's a very straight line, like we see in other frugivorous primates. Very little variation in protein, regardless of high or low fruit period. Although we do see a slight difference. What's really interesting is that this is very similar to work done by my colleague on humans, Dr. David Robinheimer, from the University of Sydney. And what Robinheimer and colleagues found is that in human populations, they also tightly regulate protein intake. And they've suggested that because of the evolution of this protein regulation, and because of an imbalance in modern day diets, this may explain obesity and the obesity epidemic that we're seeing today such that very slight changes in the percentage of protein can have dr lead to drastic increases in carbohydrate and fat consumption. And this is supported by data from the United States that has shown that the percentage of dietary protein in the diets have significantly decreased over the last few decades but the total amount of carbohydrates in the diet, or energy in the diet, has increased. And this increase is due to carbohydrates and fats in our diet. So what, what about energetics? Well, when individuals are in a positive energy balance, including ourselves, what that means is that we're gaining weight, right? Energy input is going to be greater than energy expenditure. So we're taking in more energy than we're expending. In a negative energy balance state, energy input is going to be less than energy expenditure. So we're burning more calories. And it's during those periods when we're burning more calories that we're going to lose weight. It's simple math in many cases. So at Tuanon, over the years, we've looked at a number of biological markers in urine to examine energy balance in wild orangutans, including ketone bodies, C-peptides of insulin, urea concentration, and nitrogen isotopes. And overall, what we found is that during the high fruit periods, orangutans increase their energy intake, they're eating a lot more carbohydrates and lipids. They tend to overconsume what they need, and they build up fat reserves. And also, we're finding they're building up muscle reserves as well, or muscle tissue as well. During the low fruit periods, caloric intake is decreased. They have lower carbohydrate and fat intake. But protein doesn't change protein intake stays the same. They're relying on body fat for energy, similar to what Dr. Knott has found at GP. And one of the things that's been really interesting is we're finding that they're actually using body protein, so skeletal muscle, for energy via the gluconeogenesis pathway, which is really incredible. Indeed, Dr. Caitlin O'Connor, who did her PhD with Dr. Knott at Gunung Palung and is now doing some postdoctoral research in my laboratory, found that during, when we compare high and low free periods across age classes, all individuals experience muscle loss between the low and high free periods. So when we go from high to low free periods, they experience decreases an estimated lean body mass. 
And this is pretty amazing, because what it's telling us, it's not just fat they're burning, but they're actually using skeletal muscle reserves for energy. And our data from Twana, looking at urea and delta N15, has showed that below about 3,800 calories, they start to use exogenous non-carbohydrate energy sources. So proteins and lipids for energy, but also they're using body fat for energy. And when we get below about 800 kilocalories, that's when they start using muscle for energy. So really getting into that starvation mode. And so we can think about how are wild orangutans adapted to low fruit periods. We see that orangutans have several adaptations for efficient energy acquisition during these low fruit periods. They reduce energy expenditure by traveling less, they have low resting metabolism, and they decrease their movement. We're also finding that during these low fruit periods, they're utilizing the gluconeogenesis pathway of amino acids. And this is providing them with extra, extra glucose to supplement their energy metabolism. And it can maintain their insulin secretion. Maybe during these low fruit periods, this breakdown of muscle is important because muscle is metabolically active tissue. So this could be an adaptation to reduce the cost of maintaining muscle. But it does mean that during the high fruit periods, they need to rebuild this muscle. So the question then becomes, are these periods of caloric restriction harmful? And this is something that I've thought about because we always think, oh, they're starving and they're, it's so hard to make it through these low fruit periods. But the question is, is it? So, one of the undergrads in my lab, who's now a graduate student at UC Boulder, um, Daniel Nemenko, studied this for his senior thesis, and we've continued with this research and are preparing it for publication. And what we've done is we've looked at oxidative damage in, in the urine samples throughout these periods of high and low fruit availability. So reactive oxygen species, they're produced by both exogenous and endogenous sources, they're produced internally through the body during, from the mitochondria during the energy production stage. And they can cause DNA damage, uh, damage to proteins. And this is often associated with the aging process as well. We can also, these reactive oxygen species are balanced by the production of antioxidants and by the consumption of ox antioxidants. So we have endogenous production of antioxidants in our body, but we also can get antioxidants from our diet. And so when there's high levels of oxidative damage or reactive oxygen species, we would expect high levels of antioxidants to produce, to be produced, to counterbalance these reactive oxygen species so we can maintain a neutral balance. And there's been a lot of work on animals in this area that have shown that when mice, for example, have reduced caloric intake, they live longer. When macaques have reduced caloric intake, they, they have higher survivorship. And the same is true for mouse lemurs. And in humans, what human studies have found is that even a 25% reduction in energy intake results in significantly lower levels of oxidative stress in blood, using markers in blood. So we went to explore this in orangutans, and we found a very similar pattern that we see in humans. When orangutans have low caloric intake, they have reduced levels of oxidative damage. But when caloric intake moves above the average, we start to see a rise in 8-OHDG in the urine, which is a marker of oxidative stress. So just like humans on a high caloric diet, orangutans are experiencing higher levels of oxidative damage and oxidative stress. What's interesting is that we also see that as this, these levels of oxidative stress increase, inflammation also increases. So neopterin is a general marker of inflammation, 
and we see a rise in inflammation with rises in oxidative stress, all when caloric intake is higher. While I don't have a figure of this, we also see an increase in antioxidants. And this is something that Achi Zulfa is exploring for her PhD research, looking at antioxidants in the diet and antioxidants in the urine as well. So perhaps, and we'll hear more about this from Maria Van Norwick when she talks this afternoon, but perhaps this may explain why orangutans have such high survivorship compared to other great apes. Maybe it's because they go through these feasts and famines, they have reduced caloric intake pretty regularly, and they have lower levels of oxidative stress, which increases their survivorship. And indeed, a study on birds, a meta-analysis on birds here on the right, showed that species that live longer have reduced levels of oxidative stress. So this is something that we really should explore more across the primate species. So maybe these episodes of caloric restriction are really beneficial. And maybe that's something we should think about as well as we're eating our lunch today. No, eat your lunch. I'm only kidding. <laughs> Everybody should eat their lunch. But it is interesting to think that perhaps the overconsumption of calories has led to the worldwide obesity epidemic that we're experiencing today. So what can we learn about ourselves from our studies on wild orangutans? And these are my children when they were much younger. Now I'm dealing with a teenager, so it's, it's a little different. I can't get them in a picture together, um, so <laughs> that's why I have the old one. But if we look at patterns across the globe, what we're seeing is that we are experiencing a global obesity epidemic, with a really large percentage of the population um, experiencing what we would define as obesity. And it's been said that this obesity epidemic is a direct result of a transition from real foods to processed foods that are high in saturated fats and carbohydrates. And so if we think about how the orangutans vary their diets during periods of high and low fruit availability, and think about how human diets and our diets throughout our evolutionary history have changed, we can see that our diets have transitioned from more protein and lower carbohydrates to diets with higher starch, higher refined sugars, and more processed foods. And so we can think about orangutans during the low fruit period over here, and during the high fruit period somewhere over here. And so when we think about, are we like orangutans in this way? Yes, we are. We're both susceptible to fat retention in energy-rich environments. And we're both adapted to a feast and famine ecology. The only difference is that orangutans regularly experience these fluctuations, where many human populations no longer experience these, these fluctuations in diet. So on that note, I want to acknowledge and dedicate our talk to our dear Awan, who was an assistant who worked with us for many years at Tuanon and recently passed away, and he will be greatly missed. And I want to thank all of our field staff and assistants, without whom these data would not have been collected. And I want to acknowledge also all of my collaborators on this project and all of the many, many hundreds of students and researchers um, and postdocs that have worked at Tuanon collecting these valuable data that are contributed to our long-term database and data collection. I also want to thank all of the agencies who have supported our research over the years and provided us with the permits and funding so that we could conduct this research. And I really want to thank my colleagues here at UNAS without whom none of this research 
and none of these data would be possible. Thank you, and I'm sure that we will answer questions um, now or later, I don't know the plan. So thank you all so much for listening to this talk. Thank you, Dr. Fogel. I think uh, this is the most important. Keep always balance everything. That's why no wonder my, all of my colleagues, primatologists, all look slim. <laughs> because chasing primates. Okay, I think, uh, thank you once again, Dr. Fogel. Uh, she is my counterpart since 10 years ago. And we always uh, keep contact and then uh, develop a research proposal together with our colleagues at UNA. Thank you for your time. Okay, uh, before that, we please uh, stay in here. Yes, uh, Mr. Sugarjito, please stay in here. Uh, next is the awarding of a certificate as form of appreciation and the souvenir, yes, uh, which will be given by Professor Erna. So uh, I invite Prof. Erna. Yes, the certificate uh, will be displayed on the screen. Yes, okay. Uh, and this is the souvenir. First, for Dr. Erin R. Fogel, yes, thank you. Okay, give an applause, please. I'll take a picture together. Okay. okay, and the second one is from for Dr. Sugarjito, and the certificate will be displayed on the screen. Yes, this is the certificate, and give it applause again. Okay, thank you. Okay, okay, thank you to Prof. Erna, and okay, thanks for Prof. Erna. Take a picture again together. Okay, thank you for all of you guys. <laughs> and before we continue, we will to say hello and welcome to the audience in the Zoom meeting. Hello. Okay, now next. Ladies and gentlemen. Now we come into the main event in this event that is first session presentation from three speakers. First, about reproduction and physicality of orangutans from Dr. Cheryl Knott from Boston U University, USA. And the second, about primate interaction on Sulawesi Makaka from Dr. Erin Riley from San Diego State University, USA. And the last one, about the implication of secondary metabolite on orangutan feeding is from Ms. Astri Zulfa, MSc from Universitas Indonesia National. The presentation will lead by our moderator, Dr. Nonan Saribanan, MSc. Before we start, I will read out Dr. Nonan Saribanan CV. Dr. Nonan Saribanan, born in Bandung, 31st May 1966, bachelor degree in the Faculty of Agriculture, Universitas Pajajaran, master degree in Environmental Science Faculty, Universitas Indonesia. Doctoral degree in PSL, IPB University, and recently worked as a consultant production project sustainable for SRI. To all presenter and Dr. Nonon, time and place is yours. Yes, yes. give an applause, please, to all of speaker and our moderator.
And please join us, the three of speakers. Yes, of course. Give it applause again. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. To accompany Miss. Uh, we would like to invite all the presenters. Dr. Serifman, Dr. Erin Riley, and also uh, Ms. Astri Zuma. Please. Okay. Um, first of all, I uh, will welcome all the audience here and a warm welcome to our presenters, uh, Dr. Sheryl Nutt, Dr. Erin Riley, and also uh, Ms. Astrid Zulfa, Master of Science. Uh, it's been a great day here, and uh, uh, I, I wonder, it's, it's very interesting topics about uh, what attracts women into science and conservation on non-human primates. Uh, I'm not primatologist, <laughs> you know, but uh, I surprised myself that uh, I think uh, it's about me too. <laughs> I have uh, said maybe a one, two, three, or four small research about uh, proboscis monkey in North Kalimantan and also about uh, Makakato Kiana in Central Sulawesi. Uh, I think we are in the same zone, <laughs> you know. And also from Erna, uh, we are already done the research on proboscis monkey, right? <laughs> oh, it's a very interesting topic and uh, well, I come to this presentation session and uh, we have three presenters here. I have to read the CVs <laughs> because it's very long. Uh, the first presenters are uh, Dr. Seth. She is a professor uh, from the Department of Anthropology, Boston University, also Department of Biology. And I think uh, I cannot read all because uh, it's over than 80 pages <laughs> of her CVs. Uh, wonderful, isn't it? And, and uh, we are very glad here to uh, read uh, or to what uh, what shall that uh, doctor Sharia not uh, been doing here in our symposium? Uh, so uh, I think it's a time for the first presenters, and doctor not the floor is yours. If you could just um, center it on the left hand, because the, the left hand picture is the other part is the um, not to be shown. <laughs> it's my notes on the side there. Yeah, we operated. Uh, okay. Uh, you can be 
the operator can pull in uh, the monitor the presentation. Could you make the make it full screen so you can just see the um, the, the picture and not the not the side there? Is this all right? No. Uh, yes, if you can like, make, make, make it the square, the square image, if you could make it, I think, you can all, I think we'll do a room the text layer if it's like that, if you can make it, just scoot it that way. Okay. Uh, this is PDF file, or PowerPoint presentation. Okay, I think that's, I think that's, that'll do. All right, well, good morning, everybody. It's, um, it's really a thrill to be back in Indonesia after three long years uh, since the COVID, COVID pandemic. I haven't been here since 2019. And I also want to thank the and all the, the organizers of the conference for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, so today I'd like to talk to you about some of the highlights of my work studying while we're on the con. So I started my Iran-Con research back in Gunung Palang in 1992. And I was there with um, my husband, um, Tim Lehman. So some of you may have seen um, some of his pictures in uh, Dr. Vogel's um, talk. You'll see uh, more of those uh, today. So we started back, in, I started back in 1992, and we, when Tim had just finished his PhD research on string with fig trees, and so here we are on the top of one of those, uh, one of his study uh, trees uh, in the Gunapalan rainforest. So. At Chavampanti Research Station in Gudampala National Park, it's on the west coast of Borneo, um, and it encompasses many different habitats. So we have about eight different habitat types. And you can see in this image here of the top of the, of the canopy. So it goes from peat swamp and freshwater swamp uh, down in the lowlands, up through lowland dipterocarp rainforest, and then cloud forests on, on top of the mountain. And so we can study orangutans as they adapt, as they move through all these, these different habitats and look at their, at their adaptations. Here is our research station. This has recently been renovated from the Indonesian government of the very generous grant. They rebuilt our, our, our entire facility, and now we have a fabulous lab there and facilities for uh, researchers to come and work with us. And so we encourage people, and especially the students in the audience, um, to come and visit us and think about doing research there at, at Gunapalam. Uh, the, the site is sitting right along the banks of the Ayurputi River, and it's, it's really a, a fabulous place to work. So in my talk today, I wanted to emphasize that this orangutan research is really a long-term collaboration uh, between Indonesian and Western researchers. So we have a, a long-term MOU between UNAS and between Boston University. And although I'm speaking here today, I'm really representing many, many of my colleagues and a very, very large team of researchers um, from around the globe who have worked uh, in Gunungpalam. And I kind of thought I, I would start here with um, some of the acknowledgments of some of those people. And we've been working on this work for 30 years now and have huge teams of students especially who have worked at the site and collected the data that I'm going to present to you today. 
Also in, on theme with today's talk, I wanted to, to mention some of our uh, Indonesian um, uh, students who've worked there. So we've had Indonesian students and a lot of women as well, women primatologists from UNAS as well as from um, uh, UNTAN in West Kalimantan. And these are really the, the future of Indonesian science is that these young P Indonesians who are doing their, their scripts and their master's research and their PhD research at these uh, primatology sites throughout okay. Indonesia. Uh, Dr. Mark, uh, will you, would you closer to the mic? So the, closer to the microphone? Okay. <laughs> okay. Uh, it's uh, very clear. Is that better? Can you hear me now? Okay, sorry about that. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is to talk to you about some of those research results. Um, and I'd like to explore two um, questions um, that have to do with some of the most interesting things, interesting adaptations orangutans have. And one of them is that orangutans have the longest birth spacing of any mammal. And the second is that orangutans have a very rare phenomenon called male bimaturism. And in, to answer these questions, I'm going to talk about energetics. And Dr. Vogel was a great um, lead up to my talk because she presented a lot of the information about energetics and how that um, orangutans have adapted to that physiologically. So what we're going to think about is exploring um, what the role is of the environment. So how have the orangutans adapted to the unique environment of the Southeast Asian rainforest where they have evolved? So what's so unique about this rainforest? Well, one of the key ecological features is the phenomenon of mass fruiting. And these mass fruitings occur about every two to seven years. Um, they don't occur in every site. Tuanon actually don't have mass fruitings, but they still have, as, as Dr. Vogel showed you, dramatic changes in food availability. So these changes in food availability, the, uh, especially the mass, occur about every two to seven years, and they're triggered by El Nino events. And during these events, about 80% of the trees fruit in synchrony. So despite only small changes in temperature, we have these dramatic changes in food availability and fruit production. And this fruiting pattern leads to dramatic changes in what orangutans eat. So we monitor about actually 7,000 trees every month of, for, of trees in this forest across those different habitats because this is such an important um, feature in understanding orangutan adaptations and uh, understanding their energy expenditure. So in this graph here, you can see uh, some of these changes. You can see how we have a period of mass fruiting where it's very, very high food availability, and that is followed by an extensive period of low food availability. So, so many of the trees are fruiting at the same time that they've kind of expended their energy and, and then there's not much to eat for long periods. And so orangutans go through these periods of extended low food availability. So because of these uh, mass fruitings, um, we can think about then how these dramatic fluctuations are important in understanding and influencing orangutan reproduction and physiology. So what we do is we record everything orangutans eat. So we follow them throughout the day. We collect these long-term follows. And then we take the samples they eat and we process those and we weigh them. And we, we separate those into component parts and dry them. And then we can analyze those in the nutritional laboratory. So here I am analyzing some of the components of the, the food. And what that shows us Something quite similar to what, to what Dr. Vogel showed is that at the top picture here, you see fruits that are eaten during the high fruit period. So you can look, see they actually look really delicious, right? They're very red. They're things that, orang that uh, orangutans or the primates are attracted to eat. Um, and during that period, they have about over 300, about 320 or so kcals per fruit on average. 
And then during the low food period, they're eating really low quality foods that are very high in fiber, about 75% fiber, um, bark and leaves and kind of low quality um, fruits and other kinds of vegetation. So there are these dramatic changes then between these periods. Um, here's some of the uh, data showing the changes in energy balance. So during this uh, first period, during that mass of this year shown here, the orangutans were gaining weight, so they're eating more than they expended. And during that following low uh, fruit period, they're expending more than they ate, and so they're losing weight during that period. So by collecting data on, on everything they eat, we want to think about how does energy affect their physiology? And we can measure various components in their urine. Um, and one of those is um, ketones. So this is, uh, shows us measuring ketones. Ketones are a, fat, a product of fat metabolism. And you can see in this data here that during, this is a, actually from the 1998 paper that, that uh, Dr. Vogel um, showed you, is that during the, the first part of this year, they didn't have any ketones in their urine. And during the latter half, they started producing ketones showing that they were indeed burning up their own uh, fat deposits. Um, another hormone that we can measure uh, physiologically is C-peptide, and C-peptide is um, a product of the conversion of, of uh, pro-insulin to insulin, and that also really tracks changes in food intake. So we can use that as an independent measure. So here are some data showing those changes over time. You can see that the high fruit and the low fruit period and how C-peptide is uh, following that, that change. Um, this is some work um, also uh, with Dr. Vogel's lab, um, looking at nitrogen and looking at um, urea and showing that they are indeed also burning up their, um, using their protein reserves during these, these low food periods. So to think about, to kind of summarize some of the energetic changes that we've found with orangutans, what our data show, is that orangutans go through these dramatic changes in diet, calorie intake, and energy expenditure. Um, this leads to these extreme physiological changes in their body weight, when they store fat during fruit-rich periods, and they burn it during periods of low food availability, as well as burning protein when things uh, get really bad. So how does this help us understand uh, the adaptations we see in um, females? And how does it help us understand those long interbirth intervals that they uh, experience? So to do this, we um, uh, collect urine. Here is a dong with a, a plastic bag on a stick. We actually now use a fishing pole that we can eject to collect the urine from the orangutan uh, when they uh, wake up in the morning. Here's our, our lab, our field lab at Chauvin Ponte, where we process those samples. And then we, um, we can do some tests right there in the field. We can do these, these chem strips we showed earlier. We can also measure specific gravity, which is something we use to control for hormonal levels. And it's a measure also of um, how much water they have in their diet they're consuming. And then we save those samples by freezing them and drying them on filter paper uh, for later analysis. And we can then bring those back to our lab at Boston University uh, and elsewhere, and we can measure the hormones that are in those urine samples. And what these data show us is that the, um, the changes in the female hormones are tracking those changes in energy balance. So in this graph here, the pink is the, uh, during the high fruit period, we see high levels of estrogen, it's called estrogen conjugates in urine, and during the low fruit period, the green, you see they have very low, their estrogen conjugates have gone down. And so the female hormones are tracking energy. So that has been, it was a really important discovery, is that the female reproductive hormones change with the change in energy intake that the orangutans are, uh, are experiencing. Now, what else can change? What else can affect those ovarian hormones? Another factor is lactation. So orangutans with their really long inner birth intervals are also lactating through most of that period. 
And that, that lactation is also very energetically expensive. And so when they're lactating, they also have those lower hormones because of the energy expended on lactation. And they also have to carry their offspring. They have to carry their offspring um, very far through the forest, through the canopy, and they're expending energy doing that. Uh, females may also travel more slowly and not forage as efficiently because they've got these young orangutans in tow that they're keeping with them. And so that also is having an effect on maternal energy reserves and leading to this maternal depletion. So how does this help us then understand these long interbirth intervals that orangutans have? So what we know is that then that we have this connection between energy and hormones, um, and that during periods of high food availability, they are putting on fat reserves and their hormones are increasing. And so during those periods, that is when they are able to conceive and get pregnant. But they have these extended periods when there's not much food around. So, you know, really, you know, extended periods of low food availability, and then the hormones are lower during those periods. And that's why you have this extended period of very low, um, low food intake when orangutans are not able to uh, conceive. Now, I want to sort of end my um, sort of my remarks today to, to think about how that affects another really interesting phenomenon, which is male bimaturism. And so orangutans, as probably most people here know, have two kinds of males. We have ones like the ones on the, the, um, the right, uh, big flange males with great big cheek pads, and then we have smaller unflanged males, and this rare phenomenon of male bimaturism is something which is, is quite unique in terms of mammals, of having two reproductively mature types of males. So when we think back about what we learned about female interbirth intervals, what that means is that females don't reproduce very often, and so males have very rare opportunities to actually father offspring. And that leads to really intense competition between males for access to those females during these rare periods. And think about it, you know, once every seven to eight years, you have a pretty brief window when the female could get pregnant, and so that leads to this intense competition uh, between, um, between the males. And so we can see that in things like wounds that we see here. This is a, a male um, Rocky, and you can see his, his shoulder has two slashes from canines from a fight with another male. And here's another male who just has a great big puncture wound in his cheek flange, and a large piece of his lip um, was bit off during a fight with another male. Sometimes they lead to injury, and sometimes they lead to death. So this is a male, that, that, that one, actually the individual I showed you earlier, who um, died of his, his wounds inflicted by another male. So what this means then also is that because of this intense competition, that males, the, the bigger males, the big flange males, are the ones that are able to win in competition between males. Um, females also prefer those males, they want to mate with those males. However, it's also a very energetically expensive to be, a very costly to be one of these big flange males. So this large body size has consequences. So here on the, the, the larger picture um, from 1997 is a male that we call Jariamanus. He had a, his Jariamanus' ring finger was broken off probably from a fight with a ma another male earlier. And in this picture, he is looking at a female, a female he, that was ovulating, that he was following for uh, many days. And during this period, he wasn't eating very much. He was expanding a lot of energy to keep up with this female. And he, at the end of this period of, of kind of intense mating and of following this female, the next year, you can see him in 97, he looks he looks, he's totally shrunken up, okay? So his cheek pads have totally shrunken. We know it's the same individual because of this marker he had. 
but you can see that the cost is very visually displayed here, the cost of being a flange male. And of course, we can also measure that um, physiologically. And we call this, these males that have gone through that transition, these are past prime males. And we can look at some of the energetic uh, costs they have. So one of them is that they need a lot more calories. So a prime flange male needs to eat a lot to maintain that big body size. And so they have a cost of eating, higher calorie cost. Um, they also um, have uh, changes in their testosterone levels. The testosterone is a hormone which is also very energetically costly. And these big males have higher testosterone levels than do the past prime and the unflanged males. So maintaining those testosterone levels is a cost these males have to uh, contend with. And here is that, that same male, Johnny Monis, showing his individual differences in, in testosterone between those two time periods. Also see peptide, the other, the other hormone that we measure. Um, that is also an indicator of energy turnover, and we find that that also needs, is being maintained at a high level in these prime flange males. So being a prime flange, ma flange male is very energetically expensive, and what we find in good pollen is that these wild males, they cannot maintain that form for very long. So on average, it's only about a year that we see them actually be maintain this, this flange state. Some, this one individual was able to maintain it um, a, a couple of years longer than that, but they can't maintain that for very long. And so what this does is help us understand then um, why we have the, this evolution of, of male bimaturism. So, you know, in summary, that these, these flange males, these prime males, they, they go through this energetically costly period. Um, they can only maintain that for, to, for, for a brief period, but they have high reproductive success because females like to mate with these, uh, mate, mate with these flange males. And so what this tells us um, is that we have had selection in these males to have their development be, they need to be very, very strategic in a way um, about when they develop into flange males. And so it's led to something that we call facultative development, that they are able to time development to be sort of the best period, sort of energetically, when they've got enough energetic reserves, and so that they can um, take advantage of being a prime male. So if you can't be a flange male, a prime male for very long, you want to be very careful about when you actually develop that. So I think that helps us understand at least some of the selective pressures that may have influenced the evolution of, of male uh, bimaturism. So I hope I've sort of shed some light on these two features, these two really interesting things that orangutans experience, or these orangutan adaptations, the long interbirth intervals, and the flanged um, evolution of uh, of male bimaturism and how understanding energy can help us understand those two uh, phenomena. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sherry Roth. It's a very insightful presentation. And it's a uh, very interesting topics about reproduction and physiology of orangutans. And I know there are so many questions from our audience here or from our participant in Zoom room, but uh, we can keep it uh, because the question and answer session is after all the presenters complete the speech, okay. And then uh, we're going to have the second presentation from Dr. Erin Riley. I have, yes. Uh, it's also a long CV that I can uh, read all but uh, it's a brief CV from Dr. Riley. He is the, she is the professor of anthropology of San Diego State University. 
and also visiting professor uh, to a Roma Tre University Rome, Italy, and uh, I think it's a very uh, long CV. It's about uh, more than 20 pages uh, about research and also uh, I think one is uh, very interesting that uh, she's got the awards, yes, from National Society of Collegiate Schoolers as Distinguished Member Award. Uh, uh, and she's also got Warren G. Kinsley Student Presentation Award of the Primate Behaviors and Biology Interest Group. And without wasting any of time, and please, Dr. Riley, the floor is yours. Terima kasih banyak. Selamat pagi kepada semuanya. Uh, and also, thank you very much to the organizing committee at UNAS uh, for the opportunity to participate today. Uh, just like Dr. Nott uh, said, it's been three very long years uh, since I've been in Indonesia, so I'm very excited to be back um, and to be here today. So, uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk a little bit about macaques, another uh, genus uh, present uh, in Indonesia. Okay, a little bit about how I got started in this area of research, since that's the focus of this symposium. In fact, I was interested as a young person in archaeology, um, and I thought that's what I was going to end up studying um, when I began my uh, undergraduate degree. and. I learned pretty quickly that I like to read about archaeology, but I don't like to do archaeology. <laughs> and I found that instead I could study living things. And my undergraduate mentor was a woman in science, and she was a primatologist. So that's kind of how I got interested in, uh, in primatology and made it my career. And my background is um, certainly interdisciplinary in the sense that I've pulled together uh, a trajectory that derives from biological anthropology and primatology, but also sociocultural anthropology, conservation ecology and biology, and then environmental anthropology, conservation social science. So I sit kind of, I often consider myself a hybrid of sorts. And I have been collaborating, been working uh, in Indonesia uh, for uh, uh, almost 20, a little more than 20 years, and I've been collaborating with uh, Universitas Hasanuddin di Sulawesi Selatan, Sejak Tahun 2006, and um, looking forward to continuing to work with them. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit about um, the work that I've been doing uh, in Sulawesi for the last 20 years, and that's really looking at the interface between people and macaques. So I like to begin by saying, okay, what is a human primate interface? And essentially, uh, what we know about these is that think about it in the sense that primates, what we know about many primate populations around the world is that they are affected by the presence and activities of humans. So this is an image I took at my dissertation site, Miss Luisa Tanga, uh, with Makaka Tonkiana. Um, and so this is one type of, um, one way to describe a, a human primate interface. We also know that humans and other primates live in close proximity where they encounter and interact with one another, including at tourism and temple sites, the Partiti Bali, um, but also in many areas of the world, termasuk Indonesia, they figure very prominently in folklore and mythology. So what I want to talk a little bit about today is a recent human primate interface in Taman Nacional Bantimurung Bulusaraum, which is in Sulawesi Selatan, where I've been working since 20, uh, 2010. And this is uh, a site. The National Park was created in 2004, 
as a way to protect the karst ecosystem in the area. And these images, sorry, these images. These images, yeah. These images showcase the, um, what the karst ecosystem looks like. Um, and so when we first started working at the site, uh, this is a site that's occupied by uh, Makaka Maura, which is currently listed as endangered uh, by the IUCN. Of course, this is one of seven macaques endemic uh, to the island of Sulawesi. So when we first started working at the park, uh, much of the time that we spent uh, conducting observations on the macaques, we're doing kind of standard, you know, primate ecology and behavior studies. So uh, what are they eating? Um, how are they spending their activities uh, and, and so forth? But what we started to notice in roughly around 2015 was a behavioral shift where they ended up spending more and more time along the road. So this is a road that has long existed in this area of Sulawesi. It's in fact the only road that you can use to travel from Makassar to Bone on the other side of the peninsula. Um, so this road has always been in the national park, but prior to this point, the monkeys would uh, come to the road, cross the road, and then move on. But what they started to do was spend time along the road. And hopefully you can see the Barapa Individu di Sekitarina. Sorry, saya pakai bahasa campur, tidak apa-apa ya? So, and of course, because they became more visible, then what ended up happening is that the mobiles, the cars that were passing, people weren't necessarily prepared, but maybe they would have snacks and whatever, and they would start feeding them. And of course, this ended up creating a situation where the monkeys began to learn Oh, ada mobil, ada makan, right? So they sp began spending more and more time along the road where people were provisioning them. So here, this is an image, one of my favorite, because it captures so much just in one picture. You see, uh, this is Putri, Namanya Putri, uh, the female with her infant. She's munching on jagung, right, corn on the cob. Um, it's very possible that this jagung has been in the mouth of a human. So you can think about issues of disease transmission. But also look at the infant's face. It's kind of like, oh, this is what we eat, right? And so you see a social learning process happening as well. You might also notice there's trash, right? Sampa, and this is another issue in this area. Ah, another image showing you again what the, what the field site kind of looks like. The trash is, a, is uh, also another problem um, along, along this road. And again, this sh image shows you some of the, the monkeys consuming uh, people food. So in, in collaboration with, uh, with UNHAS, we began uh, studying this, uh, this interface, right? This human primate interface. And so one of the things we were interested in is looking at how does this shift, right, this spending more time on the road, how does it impact their social behavior? So what we did is we used uh, social network analysis. Um, and so essentially what you're looking at here is we constructed two social networks, one based on data collected when the monkeys were on the road, right, which is on the right, and then also from data collected on their behavior when they spend time in the forest, because our primary social group ranges in the forest, away from the road, but then they also spend time on the road. And so what these um, illustrations show you is that the circles represent individuals, and they're different colors and sizes depending on age or sex. And then the lines, which are called edges, show the connections between individuals. And so what these two images show you is the social network based on affiliative interaction in the forest compared to the road. And what we see is that essentially the, the networks between individuals are denser when the group is in the forest compared to when they're on the road. So the, in other words, the group is much less cohesive when they're spending time on the road. And we can think about how this has potential negative implications for, for conservation. So for example, 
uh, we know that social bonds are extremely important to primate survivability and longevity. And so what we know then is that if the group is less cohesive, we see potential disruption in those social bonds and also disruption in the benefits that they accrue from those social bonds. So for instance, social learning. And another thing, uh, ultimately then, is that we think that this will likely have an impact on individual fitness as well as the viability of the overall population. Because while our research focused initially on just one group, satu kelompok, sekarang ada beberapa kelompok di, di pinggir-pinggir jalan. So now there are many groups uh, participating in this interface, if you will. And so there are implications for the broader population. We were also interested in understanding how this shift uh, impacted their ranging behavior. And so for this, what we did is we, we, used a data, so we used data that we had collected on ranging behavior before the shift, and then with data collected once we started seeing the monkeys spend time deeping your jalan. So on the left, what you're looking at is uh, an illustration showing you the home range of our primary study group. Uh, and you can see the red line illustrates the road that, that traverses the national park and this area of the forest. And so, and then on the right is uh, the same group and their home range after this shift. And so what you can see is that, first of all, the home range, so this is actually in many of our results were in contrast to what we predicted. So what we know from other studies is that primate groups, ah, cool, yeah. The primate groups that are provisioned uh, often have smaller home ranges and don't travel as far because right? that's kind of the idea. But our results were actually completely opposite to that in the sense that the home range was actually larger after the shift. It also extended, so if you notice there's a southward extension of the home range. Um, mean monthly home range was significantly larger. Uh, the mean distance to their road was significantly shorter, so they were definitely spending more time along the road. And then also the daily travel distance was longer after the shift. Again, this was unexpected given based on what we know about other studies and provisioning of primates. As you might be thinking, there's a road, there are cars, ada motor, there's a potential risk of injury um, and maybe even death. And unfortunately, we have lost um, at least one individual to my knowledge, Ini Lani, Namanya Lani. She was an older female. She was really sweet. Anyway, um, she got hit and struck by a car and didn't make it, right? So this is a, con you know, a, a continuing threat. This is not a mate. Well, it's not a highway like Jalan Tol, right? But it's, it's very well trafficked, and so there's lots of vehicles that traverse this road. So what are the, some of the conservation implications? Um, certainly this type of interface necessitates management. How do we properly manage the situation? And so over the years, we've been trying to work with the National Park, uh, again, because this is a Tama Nacional, we've been trying to work with the National Park to help develop um, educational materials. So we put together, um, uh, this was a brochure that was then turned into like a papan, you know, a sign. Um, basically, you know, giving some information, not just saying don't feed the monkeys, but trying to explain why, right? There's plenty of food in the forest, so forth, right? This is a species that is endemic to Sulawesi, right? To maybe so to get people excited about uh, this 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 primate. And so here, this is a signage that was put up in the national park. But again, it's the forest, and it's a sign, and it rains. <laughs> you know, after a little while, this is what happens, right? So, you know, the question is, you know, what kind of impact is this kind of this kind of outreach have, and maybe some, but but maybe it's not as long lasting. So we know that there's a continued need, not only for research, but continued outreach uh, with uh, with communities. 
So in terms of our future work, um, one of uh, my objectives, again, moving forward, um, is to work on building local capacity in field primatology in the area. And to that end, um, this summer, uh, while I'm here, um, we're having a chance to, um, to help build towards that. So uh, a colleague of mine, Shera, who works with the NGO Progress, uh, it's an NGO di Sloesi, um, will be offering a, a scientific writing workshop. Um, also, Ayu, uh, who's here today and who will be speaking later, um, has graciously agreed to join us for um, a workshop on primate survey techniques as well as conservation education, because she is our conservation education expert, and I look forward to learning more from her about that. And so that's some of the work we're gonna be doing. And then also Thaundapan um, will be, uh, I had to split it up just because my Indonesian collaborators and uh, counterparts were very busy this summer, and so next year, um, hope to do more workshops focusing on methods of behavior observation. So training students at UNHAS uh, techniques in observing behavior. And then in terms of research, we intend to continue um, further looking at the impacts on uh, macaque ecology behavior as well as this, the health of the overall ecosystem. And so we are um, very excited um, with a new NSF three-year project, again, in collaboration with my Indonesian counterpart, uh, Prof. Oka, di Unhas, di Fakultas Kuhutanan. Um, and so we'll be uh, doing some hopefully really interesting projects on this theme. And again, continued efforts for management and education outreach, right, to really help ensure a sustainable coexistence of these two species. So with that, um, I'm done. Is it that? So that's I. So. Okay. 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 And um, I look forward to the question and answer then. Um, also, uh, for the invitation, certainly all of my collaborators, Tarmasok, Samoa, Taman Taman, Kawan Kawan di Sulawesi, dan juga Masiswa Saya, and also all of the funders too that have helped support the research over the years. So, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Riley, <coughs> for insightful presentation <coughs> uh, about uh, climate interaction of, on Makaka Sulawesi. And uh, actually, I have some questions for you, but I will keep it first. And uh, it's uh, I have a curiosity about uh, Makaka Tongkiana because uh, I do a small research there too in uh, Central of Sulawesi. And uh, before that, we came to come to the third presenters. And I will notice that uh, our participant on Zoom room can write the question at room chat and uh, we will read it for the uh, question and answer session after all the presenters have completed the speech. So we come to the third presenters, Ms. Astri Zulfa. I have to read her. Okay, uh, CV, yes. Uh, he's a lecturer in Department of Biology, Universitas Nacional, and this is, I think, uh, is a candidate of PH, PhD and soon will be a doctor, okay, and uh, there's so many uh, experience in research uh, in Kalimantan, and uh, she was also the co coordinator of the joint research between UNAS and Rutgers University, and the publication is about a phytochemical screening on the on some leaves and foods consumed by Javan gibbons and so on. I think uh, you can read in the website maybe. 
and Miss Astrid Jova, the floor is yours. Good morning, everyone. Uh, really interesting day to me uh, to meet you all uh, in after COVID. Yeah, so this is the first time I talk in uh, with with all people again, and also uh, the two other speaker is very interesting topic have been talked. So uh, I will continue with uh, my uh, past research, yeah, and then uh, also I wanna uh, talk about my uh, future research. Uh, yeah, uh, this is about still about the food or diets in orangutan, but uh, my interesting now is in secondary metabolic how is uh, this uh, uh, metabolic secondary will uh, affect to orangutan so As we know, the orangutan is only one of the uh, great ape in Asia. Yeah, we can only see the orangutan in Kalimantan and uh, North Sumatra. Uh, there is a different uh, dimorphism between the male. Yeah, uh, uh, the picture, uh, the male and the female. Uh, the male have a cheek pad, yeah, and then more bigger than a uh, female, uh, so they have to get more uh, supply uh, food for the energy and uh, to grow the uh, body mass. So. Uh, orangutan is very selective on the diet. Yeah, they uh, choose food uh, in specific part. Yeah, so they not eat a, a same part with the uh, different species of plant. Uh, they eat seed. They eat also the pulp from the fruit. But they also uh, seed the leaf, flower, bark, and uh, sometimes they see, uh, they also eat on small vertebrate or even the soil. Yeah, I see uh, they they eat the soil and the charcoal from the pit. So there is very. Uh, very much uh, species in orangutan food list, more than a thousand plant species was eat in various uh, research station. So uh, basically orangutan uh, choose uh, fruit are on their mind f uh, food. So they, uh, they are uh, frugivore, we call them frugivore, yeah. So uh, more than 15% uh, of, of feeding time is eating on fruit, yeah. So uh, based on uh, more of their uh, research, we can see that orangutan uh, average uh, they they eat lots of fruit. So, 
So if we also see the uh, the different side, yeah, the different uh, field side, they uh, they look uh, change their their diet every month, uh, but. They still choose a food on their diets, yeah. Uh, when it uh, season of fruit is uh, up, they they uh, tend to eat more and more fruit. But uh, if the fruit is slow, they uh, choose to uh, eat bark and uh, leaf, yeah. Get uh, more uh, concentration in uh, carbohydrate and and protein. So this is different. Uh, we can look in the different area in Gunung Palung. There is a irregular forest mass thing. Yeah, so they have a mass fruiting and then go uh, low. Uh, fruiting mass, uh, so orang utan should adapt to uh, the environmental. Uh, so this is what I do in the past uh, with Dr. Uh, Erin Vogel and now I'm still working on uh, his uh, her surf, uh, survival uh, in Tuanan with also Ibu Erna. Yeah, uh, I learned about uh, phytochemical. Yeah, not uh, only the primary metabolite in plant, but also uh, the secondary metabolite in plant, especially. Uh, on the diet of orangutan. Uh, as we know that primary metabolite uh, in uh, plant, yeah, it uh, support uh, for intake of carbohydrate, lipid, and protein. It's very essential uh, for orangutan grow, development, and reproduction. Uh, but uh, very contrast with the secondary metabolite that uh, contain in the plant that may uh, might be it will be become poise, uh, poisoner to the primate. But uh, it it function in plant yeah as the uh, defense yeah the plant was defense to the uh, predator that eat the plant like that yeah. so uh, many there is uh, four met, uh, secondary metabolite uh, that dominant can found in uh, plant such as alkaloid uh, flavonoid saponin and tannin yeah So uh, this is my uh, past uh, research in Tuanan and Ketambe. Yeah. Uh, Tuanan is the pit swamp in central Kalimantan, and then Ketambe is the uh, lowland lowland in uh, Aceh. Yeah. So uh, we analyze the nutritional by uh, method of uh, proximate analysis. And then we can see that uh, water, uh, ash, protein, and carbohydrate was higher in Ketambe, yeah, in Aceh. Uh, the composition of uh, primary metabolite is higher uh, than Tuanan. So uh, the orangutan will get more uh, nutrition uh, with the uh, rich yeah, rich uh, plant in Ketambe. The, dif uh, the different one is only found 
in in this one the lipid ya yeah. so the, the lipid in uh, tuanan more higher than uh, ketambe ya yeah. this is can be affect because the environmental like temperature or yeah temperature in uh, tuanan more higher than ketambe ya yeah. and uh, tuanan is uh, uh, because it is a secondary forest ya yeah. so the uh, habitat quality probably more lower than ketambe that uh, primary forest So, uh, what we can learn from the plant metabolic secondary on orangutan diets, yeah. Uh, primates is prepare uh, uh, to not consume, yeah, to not consume a lot of uh, plant secondary metabolite or avoid all of. Uh, but this this is also uh, have negative impact to because this is uh, have a negative impact to primate uh, health like uh, for the mortality or uh, decreases the uh, the rate yeah uh, such as uh, alkaloid saponin tannin or phenol yeah uh, a few things uh, or a few research uh, has been done that uh, this plant secondary metabolic was uh, toxic for the primate, especially in tannin, yeah, be because tannin will be uh, decrease the protein uh, digestibility, so. Uh, if the primate w was eat the plant with the highest tannin, they will be uh, difficult to get the protein from the uh, from the diet like that. So, uh, but uh, in the positive way, yeah, this plant metabolic uh, uh, secondary metabolic also have a bioactive uh, as medicine. Uh, such, such as, as uh, antioxidant, antioxidant yeah. yeah. So, so the primates also, also can get, get uh, the, component the component of antioxidant, of antioxidant uh, to maintain, maintain their, their health. health. And, and then, then it's, it's also, also the antibacterial, antibacterial microbial, microbial, yeah. yeah. Maybe, Maybe sometimes, sometimes uh, the uh, orangutan uh, uh, male, male was, was fighting, fighting, and, and then, then we can, can look uh, which. Uh, diets, diets or which, which uh, plant that, that they eat, eat uh, after, after the fight, fight like that, 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 that probably uh, defend for, for the microbial. microbial. And, and also, also they have an antibacterial activity, activity the anti-diabetic, uh, anti also anti-malaria. Yeah. So, so based, based on, on this bioactivity, uh, the, the local, local people, people also use this as a, as a traditional, traditional uh, medicine, medicine to found the uh, candidate, candidate for, for the, the drugs, drugs probably. probably. Uh, so, so this, this is, is uh, uh, what, what I'm uh, read about, about the plant metabolic, metabolic uh, uh, plants can metabolic, metabolic in orang utan food. food. The research only uh, found a uh, really uh, few, yeah. yeah. So, so in Sabangau, uh, they, they they found that, that orang utan uh, was eat the some species uh, that that have or contain the secondary metabolites such as saponin steroid that can uh, 
relieve the the joint apa the relieve the joint and muscle pain ya yeah. so they can cure the uh, muscle pain in orang utan they look based on the zoopharmacognosy ya yeah. so they look the the behavior of orang utan uh, what they eat and uh, they analyze what Uh, plant meta metabolic secondary that contain in the food. Same also with uh, research uh, from Panda and Gunawan, uh, orang utan uh, eat the bark from Umkaria uh, that contain the phenolic compound. But this is uh, that we doesn't really know how orang utan uh, choose this food when their healthy was uh, going uh, change yeah. if, if 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 they have a problem with the health how they can find the right food as the medicine their medicine So this is a few study that have been analyzed the plant metabolic secondary that already used by traditional uh, local local people. Yeah. So the dominant uh, compound is flavonoid and steroid. So the The community, the local community, especially in Dayak Naju that I uh, study now, they tend to uh, use the uh, root and the bark from the same uh, plant species that orang utan use. But some of uh, part of plan is different that orang utan uh, eat and uh, the local people use this is like showing me a few things this is on, uh, only a small uh, small research yeah I, i still continue to to get more data but this is show that we have to Uh, protect more the tree that uh, local people use, especially in uh, part of root, yeah. Or we can also uh, explain to them that they also can use the other part of uh, tree, so the tree can still grow. Uh, for example, probably we can test the leaf for from the same tree that uh, local people use and then look at uh, look at the contain yeah uh, probably it will be same contain with the uh, composition in the root so they can uh, choose the leaf also to uh, to use for the medicine like that so this is the few uh, I give uh, some example that uh, plant species from orang utan eat is an endangered species. So uh, we we have to concern if this species still used by local people. This is also the endemic one from the Kalimantan, yeah but not uh, evaluated yet so we have also to concern about the population in the wild oh sorry it's two oh, minutes sorry. okay uh, yeah uh, this is my uh, future research yeah if there is uh, anyone uh, interest to join us in tuanan or Now I'll, I also start to study in Halimun with uh, Ibu Ayu. Uh, try to uh, learn about the plant metabolic secondary. 
so we can uh, know how the pattern uh, orangutan or other primates use this plant secondary metabolic. So, uh, many thanks uh, to uh, many people uh, that have been joined work together in field or uh, in Tuanan, in Ketambe, in my lab, also in my chemistry lab right now. So, uh, I hope I can uh, do it more research on this. If you have any question, you can. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ms. Asli Zulfa, for a in, uh, very interesting presentation. And before we come to question and answer or discussion session, let me give big applause for the three presenters here. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now we have uh, in the question and answer session, and I want to invite all these participants or attendants here to give the question. Maybe uh, three questions for each session, and uh, I will try to make uh, two sessions of the discussion. So, uh, is there any questions from the audience here? You can raise your hand. And for the participants in room, Zoom, you can write in room chat. Oh, first, okay, from my uh, left side. Okay, then. Uh, please uh, come to front of this stage because uh, no, the yeah, the main with okay, Pak Sugarji to a question to okay. I think we have Thank you. two people Thank you. with I questions. Think, I think my question directed to Dr. Erin. Uh, in this case, uh, the, the sound is uh, noise. Okay. So you, okay. You, I think you have to come to the front. Yeah. <laughs> okay, my question is to Dr. Erin Correct. <laughs> what actually the most significant determinant of uh, cohesiveness between the group and the road? What 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 determines significantly the cohesiveness between members of the group of your macaques in forest or in, in the road? Because you saw in the road there are more sparsely yeah? uh, compared to the forest. What, what, what actually what significant determinant? What, what determinant? Hello? Okay. Uh, yes, thank you for your question, Pa. Uh, so, uh, Pa Gito is asking, um, uh, what are the factors that, that account for why we saw the differences in um, social cohesion in the forest versus uh, uh, along the road. Um, and what we think might be at play here is the, the way, the nature of the provisioning at the site. So as you guys saw from the pictures, it's the provisioning is happening along the road, but it's also happening in a very dispersed manner, right? So the monkeys are following cars as they start to, as they move along the road and as they slow down to, to provision. And so what that ends up happening then is that the group, which typically stays fairly cohesive, kan? 
they start to then disperse to travel to follow the cars, right? Um, and so we think that might account for um, the reason why they're, they are less cohesive um, along the road versus in the forest. So it's the nature of the provisioning that is likely the, the main factor driving this. Okay, I think uh, finish the response of the second. And, and the second is, not really? Okay, the, and please mention your name. Yeah, uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, okay. My name is Idi. So the question is for Erin Riley. That is very interesting study that you compare the home range changing. Uh, please come to the front of the rooms. <laughs> okay, because sorry. And the, <laughs> the sound is very different from here in the stage and here. Okay, that's and one, two, three. Uh, yeah, do that. Uh, so. Your result is comparing the home range changes in Magrat uh, when uh, people just uh, cross on the road and then what happened if not. So uh, what do you think if, uh, like, what are you doing after you got the result uh, to the government? It's like to give the, that result exactly like, please don't feed the macaque or something. It's like following up your results for the conservation action. Yes, yeah, terima kasih banyak. So the question, yeah, is what, what do we do with those results, right? <laughs> yeah, um, so it's obviously a very good question. Yeah, one of the concerns that one of the, well, it's more of a constraint really, is that um, in other areas of Indonesia, like Bali, for example, uh, people, often travel to um, sites where macaques live and are encouraged to feed them. So one of the problems that we face is that when the park and others are trying to say to people, oh, jangan memberi makan kepada monyet, the people are like, well, why? <laughs> I can go to Bali and do it, why can't I do it here, right? Um, and you know, there's also the perception, oh, these monkeys look hungry, right? So we're trying to understand, like, what are people's motivations behind feeding? And if we can better understand that, and this is part of our future work, is to do more ethnographic work with people to better understand their motivations. Because at this point, trying to change the monkey's behavior is very difficult, right? So where does the intervention happen? It happens probably with the people. But there's a disconnect because if they say, why can I go to Bali and feed macaques, but I can't do it in Sulawesi, right? Um, so so that, that, that's kind of the, the next step with, with regard to that. But we're also trying to better understand too the patterning. So the future work will look, you know, we, we tracked provisioning and ranging behavior across two different time points. But we also want to be able to map that behavior in relation to what's happening in the forest. Right, and so to see, you know, if there's, if indeed during periods of lower food availability, because it's a very seasonal environment, if we're seeing them along the road more often than, you know, than when food is, uh, is more readily available, and whether it's linked to the, the, you know, the patterns of different species, because this is an area where they're continuing to do reforestation efforts, right? Um, so this is this is something that might help inform those kinds of efforts as well. Okay, I think that's the response for, from Dr. Riley. And any questions from the floor? Oh, okay. Uh, yes, uh, Dr. Fogel also want to ask question. Please. Thank you, all of you. Those talks were so fascinating. My question is for Cheryl. I found it, I find it really interesting at GP that the flange males there seem to have a, a really short tenure from what your data are showing um, in terms of how long they're flanged. And what's interesting is that at Tuanon, we have a lot of our males that are residential males 
that are planned seem to be planned. I mean, some of them have been planned for the entire 18 years that we've been there and big, you know, still very big, nice plans is. And so I'm wondering, it, it, I think this is something that perhaps we'll need to discuss because um, do you think that this is driven, that these differences may be driven by ecology or is there something else? Like, I just think it's fascinating that it's so different between these two sites, even though we're not geographically that far apart. Um, so I was wondering what your thoughts are on it since this is something you've studied for so long. Um, and, and Didi's research has shown that the males of Kiwanan do have high, t the flange males have high, significantly higher testosterone, just like you have at GP. So I'm kind of curious about your thoughts on these differences, because I think it's fascinating. Uh, yeah, thanks, Erin. I think the question is why, what, is that Tuan on, they seem to be able to maintain the flange state longer than at GP. Um, yeah, I think it'd be really interesting to look at the ecology of it. I mean, my understanding is that I think we, we may have, I mean, you have that one species at Tuan on that's always available. So you, I, my, it seems like you have maybe less of a really bad period, perhaps. Um, so we seem to have some, you know, more of the sort of extreme low food availability, even though it fluctuates with Tuan as well. And so I think that would be my, what I would look at is maybe one of the differences. Um, we know we do have some, you know, some males, what, one male that was able to maintain that for a while. And so, you know, you know, there's some males that are able to have that for longer, but I think it's probably, I would assume it would be driven by ecology and, and the extent to which you have these sort of how extensive those low food availability periods are, because it seems like that's sort of a big difference. But yeah, if we could compare that. Okay, uh, before a uh, question from the floor, I have uh, mentioned that in the room Zoom, there are questions to Dr. Erin Bailey. Uh, it's from Dr. Gail Campbell-Smith from Yayasan IAL Indonesia. Uh, he want to know that, uh, I think this, I have already the question. First, I would like to know Erin's thoughts on why the home range of Sulawesi Makaka is larger after the behavioral changes. As this is an, an unusual result, as mentioned, perhaps it is to do so with the high caloric human food items that they are consuming as they have more energy to expand. And the second question is, which education and outreach are very useful tools? It takes years to see any behavioral change. Does Erin have any short-term plans in place to mitigate the humans feeding the Sulawesi makaka? You got the question? Okay. Thank you very much. In the room, Zoom. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. Thank you very much. I don't know where you are, but hello. <laughs> uh, okay, Truth. Uh, yeah, Kenapa Home Range Young Abu Basar Satalanya. Yeah, so um, I think you, you've hinted that this is potentially um, uh, one, you know, the high caloric benefit of human food it could, be, could be something at play here. Um, one of the things that we think might be happening is, particularly if you look at the shape of the, of the home range in the after period, it gets extended, and that's part of the reason why it's larger. And where that extension is, is an area of the road where cars can actually pull over, because it's a very narrow road, because remember I showed you images that it's cars, right? So basically this road travels through limestone tower car formations. Much of the road, right? There's no side area, but there's certain stretches of the road where they can. And so where the home range extended is exactly in areas where cars could pull over. So we feel like the monkeys are being pulled 
into um, to extend their range to be able to access those kinds of foods. Um, this is our this is what we believe might be happening with regard to why it might be larger. Uh, the second uh, question. Um, uh, yeah, so the, the, they state that it, take, it can take many, many years uh, to, um, oh, this is Gail. Okay, hi, Gail. <laughs> many years um, before we see b behavioral change, right, in terms of education. What are some of the short-term plans to mitigate, right? And this is where the park, you know, larger, a lot of the onus of mitigation falls on the park because this is a national park. And they've tried their best to, to do monitoring where they're basically spending time along the road encouraging people to kind of move on, stop, you know, stop, uh, stopping on the road, feeding them. Um, again, we tried with some of the signage and stuff, and I showed you some images that showed how that may not persist, it may not. Um, so, um, honestly, in terms of the short term, it's, it is quite difficult. Um, we, we hope that we, as we start to build um, bigger data sets, particularly if we can get people interested in the kinds of reasons that will maybe help prevent them from feeding, right? So one of the next steps is to think about the ways in which um, provisioning impacts uh, seed dispersal patterns, right? Because we, in many areas of the world, macaques are key uh, seed dispersers, uh, thereby contributing to forest regeneration. So we're hoping if we get some data on that, if we can find ways to, that are that resonate with people. Oh, I, okay, I really shouldn't be feeding them because they do this, that, and the other. Maybe we can see. But again, it does take time. And so in the meantime, the National Park, can, you know, I'm only able to go during the summer. So the National Park continues the efforts to just, you know, try and encourage people to limit uh, their, their time uh, uh, feeding. But it's, it's definitely, these kinds of interfaces are notoriously difficult to manage. Um, but we're trying, trying our best. So thank you for those questions. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, there is the response from Dr. Riley. And I think uh, there's another question from the floor. Uh, Andrea, maybe? I think Andrea want to have question. Uh, please mention to whom the question is directed. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Thank you all for your presentations. I have a question for Dr. Riley as well, if that's all right. A bit of a two-parter. Um, the data you presented was on the group that you had been following before the behavioral change, which I'm presuming was habituated to the researchers. Are you Are seeing you the same, same change in behavior? Just uh, is clear enough? Can you repeat? Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, I presume the group you were presenting on was already habituated to researchers before the behavioral change. Um, just from your general observations, were you seeing the same change in behavior in non-habituated groups in the area? And if you were, does the change in behavior arise around the same time? What is the learning between the groups? And if you didn't see that, due to the expansion of the range of one group, were you seeing delirious effects on other groups? Was their range shifting as well? How did it impact the, essentially the rest of the population in the park? Thank you. Sorry, earlier I thought you were, you were wanting to ask, so I was like, what, what's going on? Um, anyway, yeah, no, th so we, most of our observations have been on one, ma one primary group, and this is a group that's been um, studied for a long time. Um, so initially it was only the one group, and so we didn't have a really a chance to, to, to monitor whether or not the, the non-habituated groups were, were involved, except that over the years, every time I would come back to the field, and I would, my uh, collaborators would tell me, oh, there's a new group now hanging on the road. Because initially we thought, oh, is this an artifact of the habituation, right? So is the fact that, that we are habitu these animals are habituated makes them more likely to come to the road, spend time along the road. And now we're seeing that, that um, you know, multiple groups are doing it. And these are groups that we've, that we've never spent time habituating, right? Um, there's potentially an interesting thing happening where, of course, males and macaques males are the ones that primarily disperse and so whether or not we're having kind of a transfer of a tradition as males move out of a you know maybe they're moving out of our primary group into another group and you know kind of telling their new members hey let's go to the road right 
Um, so th that might be an interesting thing to do I if we can find the time to be able to track males as they disperse and which groups they move into. That's difficult at our site, but um, yeah, so we don't, so that's where, so when I'm finally, now we're finally able to go back to the site, um, we're hoping to expand our analyses to groups that are not as, not as, that were not habituated, right? Of course, as many people in this room know, um, when you're working with primates in general, particularly primates that are endangered, and if you're working with primates that are involved in these kinds of interfaces, we have to carefully balance our desire for more research with the ethics of habituation, right? Do we really need to habituate any more of these primates, um, particularly if they are threatened with extinction? And that's something that we're gonna have to weigh really carefully. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I think uh, we have uh, at about 10 minutes left for the question and answer session. So uh, is there any questions from the floor? Okay, there. Oh, yes, please. The lady in the central of our room. Yeah. Uh, please mention your name and your institution, and you can go to the phone. Yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, thanks for the opportunity. Uh, I want to ask to Dr. Erin Vogel about uh, orangutan diets. Uh, for me, that's very interesting that we can learn uh, diets from orangutan diets principle and man to maintaining their energy and health. So uh, I don't get it uh, how the resting metabolism can help orangutan's adaptation through the fruit scarcity season. Uh, because as long as I know that resting metabolism is the metabolism that comes from uh, respiration process and the other very basic function uh, process in our body, in their body. And my second question is how orangutan or the other animal, include human, uh, regulate their resting metabolism? Uh, that's my question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, those are two very good questions. Um, so the work by um, that you're referring to is work by Herman Ponser, and and what these what they've actually found is that this is a relative to their predicted resting metabolism. It's significantly lower than you would expect. Um, but most importantly, it's their total energy expenditure measured through doubly labeled water. And so what Herman Ponser and his colleagues found is that basically to interpret it on a per weight basis, so a per kilogram basis, the orangutans are actually um, expending less energy. And, and this is because their cellular metabolism is just slower. Um, so. How would that help an organism survive through, say, a period of, real, of fruit scarcity? Well, if they just slow down their cellular metabolism, then they don't need as much energy to survive. Um, whether or not total energy expenditure is something that is stagnant or fluctuates is, is an interesting question. Um, and Herman Ponser, with his research, has found, at least for orangutans, it seems pretty consistent that they have a lower total energy expenditure. Um, so together with Didik Prasetyo, they looked at orangutans in Maramenteng in collaboration with the Bornean Orangutan Survival Foundation. They've also looked at orangutans in zoos across America as well. And they always find that orangutans have slower total energy expenditure. Now, why and what regulates that? Um, you know, that's a really difficult question because I think this is something that happens over a time scale that is evolutionary. So it's not that it, we can really come up with the, the, the proximate mechanism of this um, on a short time scale. This is an adaptation that is taking um, evolutionary time uh, to occur. So, um, you know, I think this is just 
they've been exposed to such extremes in their environment and to these unpredictable periods of fruit scarcity that this is one mechanism that individuals, you know, over time who had, you know, lower energy expenditure, a variation in energy expenditure, they survived better. And so this trait was passed on over time. Is that okay? Okay. <laughs> Okay, thank you for the response to the question, Dr. Fogel. Uh, is there any question, maybe one last question from the floor? So, um, somebody? Okay then. Uh, actually, I have questions also for, for myself, but I think it's uh, in outside this session i will give the question okay uh, that is the end of our question and answer session and uh, before i close this session uh, i want to give the opportunity to all the presenters here to make a closing statement about this symposium or about your topic maybe uh, uh, a brief uh, statement, please, to give a closing statements or to give the motivation for all of us or anything. You can. Okay, first, Dr. Sheryl, not. That wasn't yes. Um, well, I thought it was really interesting that some of the connections we've seen this morning between um, food, basically, is one of the one of the things which is most common, you know, and maybe that's one of the things which primates do a lot, or like other animals, they eat, but, you know, collecting data on the food and how, you know, from Dr. Vogel's talk and, and the talks of, that we did this uh, in the second session is understanding the changes in, in food availability and how that influences physiology, it influences you know, behavior, grouping behavior, it influences uh, you know, the secondary metabolites that they eat, and that it seems to be a, you know, a real common theme of this morning is, is understanding food and the complexity of that and how that is a, you know, a major driver of changes in, in behavior and physiology. Thank you. So next, Dr. Riley, please. Yeah, thank you. That's a, a, a great point to see those connections across. Um, I yeah, I, I would say too that um, just looking at the lineup for this symposium, which uh, you know involves uh, uh, speakers from in here in Indonesia, as well as guests like myself from from the United States, as well as other countries, and I that's really exciting and I hope that we can continue to see more symposia of this nature, not only here in Indonesia, but also in the United States um, because global collaboration um, and uh, diverse research communities um, make science better. So i um, excited about that. So again, very honored to be here and be among um, so many great researchers. Thank you. Next, Ms. Asizilva. Oh, okay, uh, there is uh, many research have been done in orangutan or in the food, but their diet, but uh, we still can learn about uh, the plant metabolic secondary that we doesn't know yet how the pattern that orangutan use the plant as their medicine. So. If there is anyone uh, who interests with it, you can join with us uh, in the field or in the lab to uh, doing research uh, to find more uh, knowledge uh, about our biodiversity in plant or in orangutan. Thank you also for the committee that uh, have been done this uh, event. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, finally, we come to the end part of the session in our discussion. 
and uh, I will give the extend gratitude to all the presenters and all participants here. And uh, thank you again. And so we can give a big applause for all of us here. Okay. Thank you, and uh, may see you in other session. Okay, thank you, and please, we could come to the seat before. The next is the awarding of certificate as form of appreciation and the souvenirs uh, also to please the all of presenters please stay on the uh, stage. yes stay on the stage and which will be given by Dr. Tatang Mitra Setia MSI to the speaker to the operator and the all of the concert uh, time and place are yours Yes, and the certificate will be displayed on the screen. First, for Dr. Cheryl Note, and give it applause, please. Okay. Okay, and the second is for next yes for Dr. Erin Riley yes, yes. And, and give, give me, me applause, applause please for Dr. Erin Riley okay thank you and the last one for Miss Astri Zulfa. Astri Zulfa, S S E M S E, give me plus, please. Okay, uh, last one for the moderator, yeah. Ibu Nonon Saribanon, M S E. Okay, give applause, please. Okay, and uh, take a picture together. Yes. Okay, thank you to all of the presenter and moderator and also Dr. Tata Mitra. Wow, very, very insightful and wonderful presentation and also the question and the answer that are give us more and many knowledge. Yes, and we want to say thank you to all the presenter and the moderator. And now we enter the time to have a break and lunch. For that, please be able to take a break first. And don't go anywhere first because lunch will be given by the committee to each table. So please stand by and the committee please help us to give lunch. And in expected to rejoin at one o'clock to continue the event. Thank, Thank you. you.